and I'll stick to Hoover and the Republicans. They started the trouble. Nothing of the kind. It was Wilson and the Democrats. Well, I know I'm right. I'll bet you I'm right. I'll bet you you're wrong. But how much? Gentlemen. One right. Gentlemen. How are you going to settle it that way? Well, what do you mean? How are you going to settle a logical argument by betting? Well, how else can we settle it? Now, you're surely not going to try and solve a logical problem by gambling, are you? Has it ever occurred to you fellows how much gambling in one form or another has helped to bring about our present state of affairs? There's a profound idea. The depression was caused by horse racing, poker, and crap shooting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead and laugh. I don't care. But someday you'll realize that the gaming tables are only the, the training grounds for the big gamblers. That we and our country, as a matter of fact, the entire world, takes against life. I don't follow you, Matthew. Right. It's very simple. We, well, we buy a house that we can't afford to pay for. So we take them off the other, and so dice for the future, hoping and gambling. But eventually we will be able to pay for it. What right has any man or woman to gamble? How long are we going on building monuments to our own, own egotism, and gambling that our children will be able to pay for. Why, the whole thing's preposterous. Well, very nice theorizing, Matthew. But, uh, theorizing. Do you suppose I'm theorizing about the very thing that... that wrecked my life? That destroyed my loved ones? My man alive, I could tell you a story about gambling and betting. Do tell us, Matthew. Well, yes, let's hear it. All right, I will. That nugget was one of the first that was ever taken out of the Colorado Gold. Yeah. It was given to me by my wife. She got it from her father, Dan Cartwright. He won it in a poker game in the Colorado Gold Fields in in 1867. You mean Ace Cartwright, the old-time gambler? Was your father-in-law? That's the man. Only he never heard himself called Ace. He didn't live long enough. Why, now his size must be worth something. It is. But it was only a, a chip in the poker pot Ace won it in. Pass. I'll open for $10,000. Alcohol. Cartwright must be all of 200000 winner. More than that, I'll figure. All right, gentlemen. How many? I'll take one. I'll take one. Silverton looking for you, and he's making for here. What does he want, to get him in the game? I thought I took all he had last week. That's what's got him fired up. He says nobody could be that lucky and honest. He's full of whiskey, and he says he's going to make you look like a sieve. Mm, maybe you better light out of here, Dan. Drugan's bad in his liquor. Drugan's needed taming for a long time. How much is in Bassler's pile? 31,000. All right, I'll cover it. I'm in a hurry. i got to be outside when Drugan comes. I'd hate to miss him. Now, oh, what do you got? I called you, Dan. Sorry, Jim. You wanted to play. I know it. You don't mind telling us, Dan. What was the card you filled in with? Ace of spades. Hmm. I don't know what I'd rather lose than win with a death card. Well, I've always figured death cards had to come in threes to mean anything. I'll just put that in your safe and I'll tote it to the bank in the morning. Wait a minute, Dan. 
What do you think my claim's worth? Well, I couldn't just say. What are you driving at? I was figuring we'd deal a hand a showdown. My claim against what you think it's worth. Well, Bassley, you say what it's worth, and we'll cut the card for it. I haven't time to deal. I reckon around 150000 What do you say, boy? Well, I don't know, but... Oh, your estimate's fair enough. We'll cut the cards. My 150000 against your claim. Shuffle them on. tonight, Dan. Well, I still say they have to come in threes. Hello, Rogan. I finally caught up with you, you crooked line double D. Come you, those words are compliments, my friend. Listen, the oily tongue has talked you out of Minnie's tricks, but this is different. Before you go, you can come across and own up to these gentlemen. But you cheated me out of my pile. Rugen, I played cards from Monterey to Frisco. No one ever accused me of cheating except bad losers. I gave them a chance for their lives before I killed them. I always let fate prove who was right. This time you ain't gonna prove nothing. I'm afraid I am. <laughs> now, Rugen, I'm gonna give you your chance. What will you? Shuffle the cards. We're going to cut the cards. And we're going outside. It'd be a shame to deface the furnishings of our friend's place. Badcock is going along with us. With our loaded guns. We'll walk 30 paces apart. And then turn. The man who cuts the high card will empty his gun at the other. Then if the loser is still alive, it'll be his turn. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Cut. I guess fate kind of decided. Well, sometimes fate calls a tie. That looks bad, Dan. That's the third ace. Yeah. But he drew it. All right, Morgan. You boys got to stand back. All right, gentlemen. You place yourself back to back. You step off 15 paces on count and then turn. Are you ready, Drogan? Yeah. Are you ready, Dan? Ready, sir? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, ten. All right, Dragon. Fire. this to my wife and the kid. It's not serious. I'm afraid it is, Dan. Oh. I'll bet you ten to one I pull through. I've lost his last bet. 
he died. His wife brought his body back to New York. She invested his money and devoted her life to bringing up their infant daughter, Paula. She made a good job of it, too, until the girl met and married a worthless young piano tuner. <laughs> Some of you fellows remember my Paula. Yeah. It was she who put me in my business. She financed me in establishing the Matthews Piano Company. Well, she made a pretty good investment. Carver, both ways. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Em. I don't believe there ever were two people happier than Paula and I. We never had an argument until... until our first boy came. But I won that argument, and the boy was named Paul after his mother. <laughs> When Paul was two years old, Fred was born. By the time we had Earl, six years later, now we realized we had a problem on our hands. It became only too evident that Paul and Fred go older, that they had inherited all the reckless tendencies of their grandfather. Oh, this ain't no fun. What do we do? Let you and Andy fight. I'll bet you six seconds you can lick him. Sure, I can lick him. Yeah, but I don't fight. Why not? Because my mom don't want me to fight. I bet you I know a guy you can't lick. Who? The big new kid in the fifth grade, Butch Benson. Where's he live? Over on Sycamore Street, but you don't dare fight him, I bet. What do you bet? I bet you my bag of marbles against yours. What's a bag of marbles to buy a tough kid like Butch? I bet you my wagon against your tricycle. Nope, my mom wouldn't want me to. Yeah, but you might run my wagon and it costs lots more than your tricycle. He's afraid I can lick Butch. Butch is probably afraid he can't like me, Andy. Oh, all right, I bet my tricycle. Quick, come on. Hey, kid, where are you going? I'm over to lick Butch Benson. Butch has licked every kid in the fifth grade. I bet my tricycle against Fred Wagon. You'll get his wagon, all right. Where you bet? I'll bet you a trillion million dollars. I bet you the jackknife I won from Bill Brown against your football. All right, it's a bet. Bet. Come on. Oh, 
Oh. What do you mean by taking these boys' things? I didn't. And after all the lectures your father and I have given you about gambling and fighting. Oh, they didn't have to bet. We'd have lost, we'd have given more stuff without work. I never heard such language from a child. Wait a minute. You boys look pale. What's the matter? I'm sick. Oh, Mom. Well, we'll be getting along, Mrs. Matthews. If I were you, I'd put those children right to bed. But with the measles and the mumps going around, you can't be too careful. No. But how do you do, Mrs. Jackson? How do you do, Mrs. Matthews? Your son took 10 cents from Peter. I don't mind the money, but I will not have my son gambling while he's still a child. Plenty of time for that after they grow up. If either one of you got this boy's money? Oh, all the city have to go when we tell their mothers. Whichever one of you has that 10 cents, give it to me at once. That's why they're sick. They've been smoking butcher's pipe. Have you been smoking? Well, not much. I don't know what I'm going to do with you boys. Well, now wouldn't be a bad time to put, put us to bed without any supper. I couldn't eat anything anymore. You'll be lucky if you don't get a spanking into the bargain. Run into the house. I'm terribly sorry. Come on, Ted. Those boys are my guys. You can play too. Let them play too. I'll shoot you for a million or any part of it. I'll cover it all. to meet the situation with a sense of humor. Again and again we told each other that the boys were bound to outgrow their wives. As time went on, we realized how much the child is father to the man. Expelled from college. Well, what do you mean to say they expel a fellow from school over a little thing like a, a betting pool? College professors and a good many other people don't look upon those things the way you and Fred do, Paul. We'll have to think of some story to tell your mother. She mustn't know about it. Yeah, of course. Say, Dad. Have you thought over that airplane proposition? Yes, 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 yes. I'm not investing in airplanes, Paul. But, Dad, think of the future in aviation. Why, in a little while, everybody will be flying. You've been flying? Sure, but not half a dozen times. You better not say anything about it to your mother. She'd go up in the air, too, I mean, not the way you did. Oh, but, Dad, look, here's an opportunity to get in on the ground floor on this thing. It's only part of it I like. Well, of course, if you haven't vision enough to gamble. No. There it is again, gamble. It's a gamble like all your other ventures, Paul. Well, you have to take chances if you want to make money. Oh, my dear boy, there are chances and chances. For example, a man forges a check. He takes a chance of making money. But I wouldn't consider it a wise one. Would you? Huh? Well, uh huh? I had the bank honor a check for $1,000. A check that I didn't sign. 
Why did you write it, Paul? Well, I knew you wouldn't give it to me. I saw an opportunity to make a clean up and then replace the money before you found out about it. Paul, what are we going to do? You mean about the check? Oh, good heavens, why I wasn't thinking about the check. I'd honor a dozen of them if I thought it'd help you to settle down. Well, I will someday. That's what you said when you chucked college and beat your way around the world on a freighter. When you went into automobile racing and almost killed yourself. When you did the other insane things in craving to satisfy your desire for excitement and thrills and taking chances. Sun, sun, when's it all going to end? Oh. Oh. Why don't you try? Why don't you... Why don't you come into business with me? I'd stagnate. But why? I, I don't understand. Well, Dad, we're made out of different stuff. I couldn't stand it here. It'd bore me to death. Well... Well, supposing you were bored once in a while. Life isn't all fun, you know. Don't your mother and her dreams for you? And my ambition for you? Don't they mean anything? Sure, of course they do. But why should I tell you and mother I'll do things that I know I'll never do? But I'll settle down. When I know that the first train whistle I hear will make me want to be on the move. When every dollar I get in my hand makes me want to turn it into ten in a hurry. I don't know. I'd like to see things differently, of course, but I just can't. Now you're talking the way your grandfather used to talk. You know the kind of an end he came to? Yeah. What's wrong with an end like that? It came after he'd really lived. He was shot down while life was still sweet. When it meant adventure, excitement, and romance. Adventure? Excitement? Romance? Mother sounds interesting. Hello, darling. Hello, Mother. Hello. Who was this adventurous, exciting, romantic person you two were talking about? Why, uh, why, your father. Oh. How are you? Pardon me, Mr. Matthews. Would you please sign this order? Excuse me, dear. Wait a minute. Well, you're downtown early this morning, aren't you, Mother? Yes. It's the early bird that catches the bargain. What if my husband's been getting any love letters? <laughs> and I'd look forward, so, to seeing Fred graduate. Yeah. So it went on for a few years. Paula saw her dreams and ambitions for the boys turn ashes. It broke her heart. It killed her. I almost hated my own son. When we got home after the funeral, I gathered the boys around me and, and made them promise that if it were humanly possible, we'd all get together every year, all five of us, and commemorate Paula's birthday. The first birthday passed like this, then came the next in 1915. Paul was making quite a name from Davier. Fred was working in a brokerage office, Earl 17 and Henry 50. was still at school. Why the port, Dad? I like brandy. No, I don't know. Except perhaps your mother was rather partial to port. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot. Pretty soon we won't be drinking either port or brandy. Apple sauce. That's right. I bet you that we have prohibition within two years. For how long? Oh, boys, please. Remember, this is your mother's birthday. Oh, I'm sorry, Dad. We're all bright, though. There's something in the air. Distillery stocks are falling off rapidly. Oh, I don't think we'll ever have prohibition. I don't think the American public would surrender that much of the liberty. Yeah, the prohibitionists have a new name for liberty. What? They call it life. Huh. Oh. Well, what's new in aviation, Paul? Not much, Dad. Things are out of tame. Say, I have a little surprise for you. Yeah? I joined the Lafayette Esquadrille. Gee! Oh. 
Isn't it rather silly to fight other nations' battles? Well, it's going to be our battle soon, Dad. It's inevitable. I'm just getting a head start on the others. Well, I suppose it's no use trying to dissuade you. When are you leaving? Next Tuesday. I'm sailing on the Lusitania. The Lusitania? You can't, Paul. The German government have warned people about sailing on that boat. Why, I understand they've... they've issued a sort of medal showing what's going to happen to the ship. I know. I have one of the medals. In face of that, you're sailing on that boat? Sure. I have a bet with the guy that gave me the medal, at the right odds, that I'll land in Southampton safe and sound. And with the Lusitania, went down my oldest son, Paul, named for Paul. Your brother, Mr. Earl, is here, Mr. Matthews. All right, tell him to come in. Hello, Fred. How's the boy, Earl? Great. How's the rising young Midas? <laughs> Everything I touch isn't turning into gold yet, but I can't complain. <laughs> What's new? Oh, nothing much. I don't think the piano factory's doing so well, though. I know it isn't. I offered to lend Dad some money to tide him over, but he wouldn't take it. Well, I wouldn't be so scrupulous. How about lending me 10000 10,000? What for? Well, you know Schultz? <laughs> I should. I've dropped him up on his poker and roulette table. Well, he's going into the liquor business and he's willing to cut me in for 10,000. It's a pretty risky game, Earl. Quote King Midas, who selleth his country short. <laughs> yes, but that same country has stopped the manufacture and sale of liquor. How can you work it? A lot of guys are doing it. They get the stuff from Canada or other countries. They cut it down, add alcohol, and make several bottles out of one. They're making synthetic whiskey and gin, too. Well, the profits are enormous. <laughs> they should be. Well, how about it? I'll split with you 50-50. All right. Stop in this afternoon, I'll have the cash. Right. I don't want any checks to be traced back to me. Right. Well, I see Henry's still making touchdowns for the old alma mater. Oh, he'll probably make the All-America team this year, too. Oh, well, Henry's kept his nose pretty well to the grindstone. Dad says it looks as though there's going to be one white sheep in the family anyway. Well, because Dad looks at it that way, let's hope so. Here's to the white sheep. Did you park here to talk about the weather? Oh, 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 well, well, no, I... What was that question you wanted to ask me? Well, I... You see, I... I well... Don't, don't you think I'd better take you home? Yes, maybe you had. 
getting cold, and it's bad enough for one of us to have cold feet. What? Oh. Well, you see, it's, uh, it's like this. I, I, I mean, uh, uh, that, that, that is, I think that... Yes, uh, Henry, I'll marry you. It's only to get you out of your agony. marriage had to be postponed for two years owing to the serious illness of Dr. Strickland, which compelled Carter to go abroad with him. Uh -huh. In the meanwhile, Henry has applied himself to my business, and save for an occasional visit to the racetrack or a game of poker now and again, he seemed to have overcome his heritage. Mm -hmm. The next birthday in 1924 was also a celebration of the Strickland's homecoming. Excellent. <laughs> hey, you know, the real reason for my coming home from Europe was the Matthews Piano Company. How was that? Well, every day Cora would be getting a letter that was fat enough to hold the lease of the Woolworth building. <laughs> so I figured that if Henry was devoting all that time to letter writing, his father's business must be suffering. <laughs> Better to bring Cora home to him before he started manufacturing ivory pianos with walnut keys. <laughs> <laughs> it was nothing of the kind. You know I had to bring you back because you insisted on explaining to and demonstrating to every European we met what the governor of North Carolina said to the governor of South Carolina. Uh, <laughs> that's another angle, isn't it? <laughs> hey, Cora, dear, I never knew before that you were left-handed. Well, oh, I... Oh, she uh, isn't, Carter. Well, you know, when you hold hands under the table, somebody's got to stir their coffee with the left hand. <laughs> oh, Daddy, you're impossible. How is it you fellas don't sell brandy? It won't cut. Oh, I... My... My friend. Why should you ask uh, Earl about selling brandy? I thought you were in the trucking business, Earl. Uh, well... You see, Dad, in the trucking business, everybody handles a case or two now and then. Well, my dear boy, doesn't it bring you rather close to bootlegging? Oh, well, it's nothing serious, Dad. Wouldn't you call it serious to have your brother involved in some racket which means the murdering of hundreds of men every year? Oh, now, Dad, don't believe everything you read in the newspapers. There's really no danger to it if you know what you're doing. It's just a matter of being smarter than the other fellow is. I beg your pardon, sir. What is it, Evans? You want it on the phone, uh, Mr. Schultz. Oh, yes. Will you excuse me, please? Well, shall we go into the other room? Well, providing the brandy goes with us. Now, Daddy, remember what the doctor said. My dear, I've been a doctor for 30 years, and for 30 years my patients have been disobeying me. Why should I shatter their precedent? They're quite right, Doctor. <laughs> Bring the liqueurs, Evans. Yes, sir. Wait a minute, Cora. I want to ask you something. What? Uh. Oh, I beg your pardon, sir. Well, it's quite all right, Evan. Don't mind us. Thank you, sir. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? Well, no, of course not. Well, you should be. <laughs> uh uh. All right, if it's that important, I guess I'll have to. Sure. Well, I'll leave in a few minutes. Fred. You knew about Earl. Why didn't you tell me? Because I thought it would worry you, Dad. Besides, I don't see anything to rip us about. No, I... I suppose you don't. You didn't think it might worry me a good deal more to have to find it out for myself? 
I'm sorry, Dad, but I'm afraid I'll have to break away. Is this business of yours? Well, in a way. Oh. I want you to promise me to give it up. As a matter of fact, Dad, I'm trying to. That's what I'm going downtown about. Promise me. I promise. So long. So long, everybody. Bye. 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 Good night, Evans. Good night, sir. Sorry, Carter. It's just a matter of being smarter than the other fellow. Well, this was Schultz's way of ending the partnership. You mean his partner killed him? Oh, I don't suppose he did the actual killing. Only arranged it, paid for it. Oh, but, but, but why? Why should he want to kill her? Well, told me he wanted to quit the racket, and that Schultz and he had been having differences. This is the way they settled them. Oh. Uh, I'll tell that to the police. No. No, it won't do any good, Dad. There isn't a thing they could trace to Schultz. These fellas are too slick. You mean to say my brother can be shot down in cold blood and nothing can be done about it? His killers can't even be punished? Well, I'm afraid that's the way it is in Earl's business. Strickland to see you, Mr. Matthews. Oh. Well, tell her to come right in, Miss Gray. Any news of Henry? Yes, dear. Sit down. I found him. Where? In a downtown hotel. What hotel? I must see him. I wouldn't, Carter. He's been drinking rather heavily. He said he didn't want to see you or me or, or any of us right now. Didn't he explain anything? Nothing. He seems to have gone all to pieces over old dead. Now listen, Danvers. Paradox has got to win that fourth race this afternoon if you have to fix the jockeys on every one of the six other horses. You understand? Yes, sir. I'll do my best. But that takes dough. Okay. It's 1,500 to spread around. You get the other 500 when Paradox wins. Right. I'll see you at the track.
sorry. How are you, Mr. Schultz? Okay. But I don't recall. Henry Matthews. I met you with my brother Earl at your place one night. Oh, yes. How are you? Let's see. Guess you folks must have been pretty badly broken up about Earl. It handed me a terrible joke. Yes, sir. I uh, try not to think about it. By the way, who are you betting on for this race? Oh, I play the favorites. I don't know much about this racket. If you want to make a little pile, lay a hundred on the Paradox. Paradox? Well, he's a rank outsider. A 75 to one shot. He shouldn't be in the same race with Hussar and Madman. Sure, but I do know something about the racket, and you can take my word for it, Paradox is going to win and pay off 75 to one. Well, i got to get mine down. See you later. Better lay that hundred, Joe. to you, Matthews. Know any more good ones? Well, we have more long shots today. You seem to know a lot about this racing racket. Know a lot about it? Well, I know everything about it. How about dropping around to my place some night? We might get together on a few things. All right, I'll do that. Goodbye, Matthews. So long. And don't forget. Don't worry, I won't. Schultz, that Henry Matthews is here to see him. out there. Oh, it'll do. Well, you sure get away with murder, Schultz. What do you mean? Oh. Mark cards, dealing them off the top and the bottom, tricky table legs. <laughs> Your dealers and croupiers don't even have to be subtle. 
The cops are so anxious to throw their money away, they don't see what goes on. Where did you learn the tricks of the game? Well, my older brothers taught me about them when I was a kid. What I can't figure out is why a smart guy like you has to play for peanuts. Meaning what? I can make as much in a day at the track as you can here in two weeks. Oh, I have another line or two. Sure. And you wake up some morning with your blood fertilizing somebody's front lawn. Like Earl did. There's something in that. I've been thinking about this racing racket since I spoke to you last. You clean up in it. And not only horse racing. Things could be done with wrestling and prize fight. Why fool with a handful of saps when you can trim millions all over the country? Sounds big. How'd you go about it? Well, I've got ideas and I know how to work them. All I need is a backer that's willing to put up a dollar and make 500. I'll think about it. Drop around when you have something figured out. All right. See you in about a week. All right. By the way, have you any more tips on the races? Yeah, I have one. What's that? Don't bet on Paradox again. <laughs> Hello. You are working. Thanks, boss. Come in. Hiya, gents. Hello, Talmud. How's the strangler? Okay, hands. The next time you jump on my ribs, don't use so much follow through. Okay. The boys put on a pretty good fight. I almost believed it myself. Thanks. Say, hey, where'd you pick up that Bowery, Polish? Polish, you're dizzy. That's the same lingo I use in California when I wrestle the terrible Spaniard. There you are. Thank you too much. All right, now you've each won a match. The papers that you met in a nightclub and got into a brawl. You were planning the idea that you're both out for blood. And the rematch next month will be a sellout. Swell, who wins the next round? You do on a foul. Then Talmas challenges you and you refuse to meet him. Next, Talmas beats a couple of setups and you're compelled to meet him. After that, I'll think of something else. That'll be all, boys. In the meantime, whenever you can call our reporter, remember to spout out to him how much you hate the other guy yet, understand? Say, how about coming up to my house for a drink yet? You're on. All right, but don't let anybody see you. We won't. So long. I'll be seeing you, boys. Well, to get all the bets down? 37,000 and 25 grand last week. We're doing all right. Well, you haven't seen anything yet. Wait till I start working on the dog tracks. Dog tracks? How can you fix a dog race? They don't have jockeys. Listen, I'll get next to those whippets if I have to learn to bark. Good night. Good night. And these are the facts as I heard them five or six years ago. The only conclusion I could come to was that Henry had become the gambling partner of the man who killed his brother. I've never seen or heard from him since that day in the hotel room. Poor little Cora. She became disillusioned and broken-hearted. Her father demanded she never mention Henry's name again. As for the rest, well, it wouldn't have been difficult to foretell what would happen to a man of Fred's caliber. The stock market crashed two years ago. Some of you probably read of his... his suicide in the paper. Yes. If it please the court, I shall call the defendant, Henry Matthews, to the stand. Do you solemnly swear that you will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. What is your name? Henry Matthews. Did you kill Albert Schultz? I did not. Oh, 
Will you tell the jury how you happened to be in Schultz's office the night of the murder? Well, Schultz was killed the night the world's heavyweight champion successfully defended his title. After the fight, I went to Schultz's office. Henry, what happened? Why didn't the champ lay down? What do you think? What do I think? I'm clean for almost a million bucks, everything I got. Then you got all the bets down, eh? Well, sure I did. I thought it was in the bag, like all the other things we've been in on. You told me. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to tell you something else, too, Schultz. Sit down. Well, well, what is it? Schultz, the champ didn't lay down. He never intended to. But you told me it was all fixed. So you bet your last dollar. Why, you dirty double cross? I don't get you anywhere. I told a few people I was coming here, a few people that feel about you the same way I do. Well, what is it? Schultz, seven years ago, you had my brother put on the spot. I did Oh, yes, you did. And I found it couldn't be reached through the law. I decided to take things in my own hands. I knew I couldn't kill a man, even a rat like you. So I looked around for another way. And I found that money meant more to you than anything else in life. And then I realized that if I could build you up into wealth, and then break it, that you'd pay somewhat for the suffering you brought my family. That first horse race was fixed. So you'd win a pile and think that I was mixed up in the racing racket and all the rest of the wrestling matches, the, the lotteries, the smaller prize fights were all a build-up for tonight. I looked forward to this night. I've dreamed about it. I've lived it over in my mind a thousand times. It's meant so much to me that I, I plunged every cent I had on that fight too, just so you wouldn't smell a rat. It meant so much to me that I stayed away from my father and my friends during all these years for fear they'd talk me out of my ambition. Well, now that I've heard you squeal and seen the look in your eyes, I know it's all been worthwhile. I never thought you'd be sap enough to think that you could get away with this. From the time you leave this room tonight, you'll be put on the spot. Why, I've had guys rubbed off for less than... policeman was attracted by the shots and came into the office. When I told my story at headquarters, they didn't believe me. They said my story gave a motive for the murder. They said that I had shot Schultz, wiped my fingerprints off the gun, and had thrown it near the window. Well, I've told the truth, and that's all I can say. That's all. You with us. Gentlemen of the jury, you have heard this young man's story, and I'm confident that you believe him, as I do. He has made mistakes, it's true. But those mistakes were caused by misguided loyalty and affection for a brother. But of the crime of murder, gentlemen, he is not guilty. And I'm sure you will bring in a speedy verdict to that effect. I thank you. And this young scapegoat admits that he swindled untold numbers of people. And for what? For the most ignominious of human motives. Revenge. A man who would do the things that this defendant has confessed would do murder. If you free him, you will turn loose a heartless felon, a consummate rogue, who will return to his nefarious rackets 
and prey on society all over again. If you don't convict him, you will be responsible for the worst miscarriage of justice in modern times. I demand, the state demands, that for the willful, premeditated murder of Albert Schultz, you send Henry Matthews to the electric chair. I thank you. and face the jury. Gentlemen, have you reached a verdict? We have. What is your verdict? We find the defendant not guilty. I waited dinner for you, but he didn't come. Well, I did want to see you, Dad, but I had something important to look after. Oh, well, if it was important to you, I suppose... Listen, Dad, I know you've been to a heavy expense with these legal bigwigs and all that, so I've been looking around town to see if there isn't some way to pay you back. And I found the sweetest little thing that I can turn into a fortune if you let me have 5000 for a few days. $5,000? Yeah. I couldn't let you have five cents. What do you mean? I'm broke. You're what? Bankrupt. Business has been going to the wall for years. I had to mortgage everything to pay the attorney's fees. Just making an inventory of this job lot of pianos. See if I couldn't raise a little cash. Right. It's almost impossible to think of your being broke. <laughs> You mean to say this, this mess I was in, that trial, took your last money? You know the size of it? Well, why didn't you tell me? Oh, what difference does it make? What difference does anything make? Well, now, Dad, I don't like to hear you talk that way. I didn't like to hear you talk that way, Henry. Or Earl, or Fred, or Paul. Too late, Dad. Too late for what? Try to be what I should have been. No, Henry, I don't think it's ever too late for that. Okay. Let's take inventory. You mean it? Okay. <laughs> Concert grand, $895. Oh, cost me $1,500. Oh, well, don't worry, Dad. You'll be making money again. I mean, we will. Oh, I hope so. Here, here, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me give you a hand with that. Oh, no, bother, Dad. I'll get it. Wait, wait, wait. These things, they have to have a bit of a neck with this. There. What is it? I don't know. I can't breathe. Now, I'll get a doctor. No, I'm afraid it's too late. Oh, there, don't say that. You can't go now. I never realized until from that what you've been. So regular and so brave. you got to stay with me, Dad, so I can show you what you mean to me. Dad, I'll, I'll never gamble again. I'll work. I'll do anything to make you happy. I'll, I'll prove to you that I, I can be different. Uh, I'll bet you, you, you can't. I, I bet you I, I can, uh. Well, Dad, got a surprise for you. What is it? The attorney just called. The judge took the Matthews Piano Company out of the hands of the receivers this afternoon. Well, that isn't much of a surprise. 
I knew you could do it. <laughs> Henry, you deserve a lot of credit. To make a bankrupt company solvent after four years of depression is an achievement. Yeah. I, I guess I lost the only bet I ever made. Yeah. Hello, Daddy. Well, 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 here's the big fellow. Hello, Well, we've been. We've been to Granddaddy's trickle. Huh? And what did the old rascal have to say? He told me what the governor of North Carolina said to the governor of South Carolina. What's he been teaching the child? I don't know. I guess I was out of the room. Well, and... And what did your granddaddy tell you that the governor of North Carolina said to the governor of South Carolina? It's a long time between strawberry shoes. <laughs> <laughs>